This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm Steve Gould. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you for all the five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, I'm like a broken record, but uh, if, if you could, if you could do that, if you haven't done it, please do it. It helps the show, helps get attention, gets eyes on the show. Apple doesn't really have any kind of um, uh, analytics they give out to the public. So when people look and they're looking to, to be a guest on a show or, or their agent or someone's looking, they look at the reviews. So I'm at like 750. If I get to 1,000, that would make my millennium. So uh, if you could do that, appreciate it. If you really love the show and uh, you really want to support it, Patreon is the place to do that. The link is in the show notes. There's two levels. There's patrolman. There's sergeant. There's extras. I'll, I'll mail you a TPS logo sticker. You'll get videos of um, all the interviews uh, when they're available. Sometimes active duty um, guys don't want to go on video, but there's a bunch in there already. I do little behind the scenes stuff, a little bit of uh, some work stuff, and um, also for like sergeants, I'll do the I'll do the shout out. You can ask a question, I'll answer, and um, you know you'll have that direct access to me on Patreon. It's like a Facebook feed that's private. You can get on there and just kind of scroll through the content. So uh, if you really love it and you want to show your support, uh, that's the way to do it. And uh, speaking of patrons, let's, I'm going to do the, the shout-outs for the Patreon sergeants. Uh, they keep the lights on. I love these guys. I'm, of course, talking about Andrew Horton, Trevor Daly, Rick McCormick, Scott Minkler, Tammy Walsh, Sean Clifford, Braden Walker, Sasha McNabb, Corey Payne, Glenn Topping, Mike Wynn, Nathan Gowan, Jason Lau, Dylan Pyrozik, Sarah Pomroy, Lauren Stimson, Alec Wozik, Brandon Hooker, Jake Pinedo, John Shoemaker, James Rose, Seth Wright, Tony Fahey, William James Long, that's Deputy William James Long to you, Andy Biggs, Chris June, Adam Mehal, the great Gary Steiner, and Lane Campbell. I love you guys. I'm in love with you. Um, if you don't reciprocate, I don't care because that's how strongly I feel about you. So thank you. Thank you for all the donations. Um, every time I see a new person join Patreon, I get a pop-up on my phone. And it's like Pavlov's dog. I start salivating. So I appreciate that, everybody. Today's episode, um, I won't bore you with any more of, of uh, housekeeping things. Today's episode is going to be a great one. I have 30-year veteran of law enforcement. He was started with the state of New Jersey. He went federal. He was with the Marshals ATF Customs and ended with Homeland Security. The guy's got buckets and buckets of stories. Excited to have Lorenzo Toledo on the show. Lorenzo, thank you for coming on, man. Steve, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So you start, oh, my pleasure. I'm, I'm honored. So you start state with the state troopers in New Jersey? No, I actually, I actually started um, with the Marshals, believe it or not, with the U.S. Marshals in New York City. Oh, with, wow. Uh, Southern Dis- yeah, it was Southern District in New York. I went to a criminal justice school. I was picked up as a co-op student with the program that the U.S. Marshals had with the college. Okay. And I was the first co-op student hired right after college uh, with the Marshals, making uh, a grand total of like, I want to say $13,000 at the time. Oh, <laughs> living, man. living in New Jersey and commuting to, uh, to New York City. Wow. And the marshals based out of New York, or were you doing um, a lot of court and transports or were you doing apprehensions or? We did. We, what I was doing, um, I was mostly doing court. Court. I was working. I was there in a very interesting time because the mafia commission trials were going on at the same time. So I was sitting I was sitting with all the, the mobsters from New York City, as well as the Hells Angels who were on trial and a, an Irish group that was called the Westies. The West. so all these not a very tough name. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that was a tough Irish crew that they had, and it's funny because Giuliani was the uh, was the prosecutor for the U.S. attorney. He was a U.S. attorney at the time, right? And uh, he did a phenomenal job in New York City. And um, I did some wit- witness protection, and some some you know we went out for some arrests and and have fun doing that. Um, it was a good time. That's it was awesome. A really good time. I've talked yeah. to a few marshals before, and. Um, I've met a few. I met an air marshal at a Christmas party, and he was like, <laughs> he was like an uh, an ex like you know s- s- operator, you know, for the military, right, special right. forces, and he's like, this is the worst job I've ever had. Yeah, yeah, the marshals. Oh my god, the sky, the air marshals is the worst job. And I'll tell you, the deputy was marshal job, unless you're in witness protection or you're in uh, fugitive task forces, being in court is tough. Yeah, it's brutal. You know, 
I know that they've changed it. I believe they hire court security officers who are mostly retired guys to do I've that seen now. That. Yeah, so that's that's a good thing. But for me, I'll tell you what, even though they didn't appreciate it, I did at the time because I was young. And those trials that I sat through were phenomenal. I mean, I they were the next day's news, you know. I got to see the best attorneys um, cross-examine cops and, and, and everything else. And it, it was amazing. It was good, a good experience for me when I had to testify down the road on cases. Oh, I can only imagine. And I, yeah. it must have been tough as a, as a like a kid. You get in the marshals and you just like, you know, all you hear about is, you know, you're riding a horse across the plains or, you know, um, right. the, the movies when you're chasing somebody down, Dr. Right, Kimball. Right. And then you're like, yes. oh, I got to sit in this courtroom. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's funny, man. It, it's real funny. In fact, one of the inexperiences that I had, I had this uh, this guy by the name of Roy DeMeo. And he was a really bad guy under Gotti, under um, Gotti's crew. He was one of the hitmen that Gotti used, and he had his own little minion of people that they used. And these guys would chop up bodies. And I didn't know much about this crew. So after uh, Colombo died, the, um, I'm sorry, after Castellano died, they, they remanded all these guys. So one of, the, one of the guys that was there was this guy, Henry Borelli, I think his name was, young guy. So he tells me, hey, kid, uh, can, you, can you give this watch to my wife? She's right behind you. So I said, sure, sure. So I, I get the wife and, and I, I, I'm, I get the watch and I give it to the wife. And, uh, you know, we walk the guy and he goes, hey, thanks a lot, kid. I appreciate it. You're a nice guy, you know. So now I'm walking with these guys. And now this, I'm with the senior deputy. And I said, wow, what a nice guy. You know, this guy's really a nice guy. And she goes, nice guy. And that guy's chopped up like 30 people. Oh. So <laughs> that goes to show you the experience, you know, that when you don't know what you're doing, um, you know, it's better to keep your mouth shut and just learn from the older guys. Yeah, that's that's freaky to to yeah. think that someone can be that kind to a person and then like just yeah. switch it off and yeah these these guys were crazy they were really bad people you know damn so did you go from you did that for a while and then did you try out like local law enforcement or state level or something no what happened after that is I went to ATF I got I got um I met an individual by the name of Alex Diatri who's one of the best agents ATF has ever had. Um, unfortunately he was shot doing an undercover in, in, in Miami and his partner was killed. Oh, geez. And, um, I met him and, and we took a, you know, he took a liking to me and, and he, uh, he offered me a job and I went in there and got interviewed and I passed the interview. Um, I'm of Cuban descent and it was funny cause when I lived in New York, I had an Italian accent. So when they were doing the interview before I went in, Alex, the actor tells me, Hey, Paisan. <laughs> you know, how are you doing? I said, Hey, how you doing? And when I came out, he goes, Hey, I didn't know you were Spanish. You tricked me. <laughs> but I, I ended up getting the job anyway. And, and I, I worked and I had the distinct honor of working for a supervisor named Dominic Polifron, who who's the individual that went undercover on the Iceman Kuklinski case. I don't know if you're aware, familiar with that case, no. but it was a hitman that killed over 30, 40, 50 people. Wow. There's HBO documentaries about him. And I had the honor of learning the little tricks of the trade working for him. That's um, awesome. Yeah. After that, I did, I did seven years with ATF. And then um, I went to work for the Bergen County prosecutors because they wanted to transfer me. And I didn't want to get transferred. Yeah. Because that meant wearing suits and losing your car and everything else. And I, I wasn't going to do that. So I, I decided to go local. No kidding. And when you go yeah. local, does it... Do the, are the feds like the state in the municipalities? Is there like an expiration on your FLETC and your special schools and all that? Well, when I went in, I was told that my time with the feds, I could just buy it with the, um, you know, with the locals and uh, with the county. And but it turned out I really couldn't do it. It was too much money. Ugh. It was going to cost me like like a hundred thousand dollars. So I was going to lose uh, nine years. So I ended up getting an opportunity to go to customs. And I, t I took that opportunity. But it's funny. I made more money in the county level than I made as a, as a senior special agent with ATF. I was actually making more money. And my, my um, perks were better because we were allowed to use our county cars to take home, to use it on weekends. And with the federal government, you can't do that. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, um, I've said this before in the podcast, but the f depending on the state you're in, the federal stuff can be weird. Like there's... Like Massachusetts yeah. doesn't award, they don't really give anybody peace officer status. It's just everybody's right. got their own little fiefdom, including mm -hmm. the federal agents. They don't, like my a friend of a friend at the same Christmas party, I'm at the air marshal. He, yeah. he got an embossed FBI. He'd been a manager at Best Buy forever. 
it's sharp kid wow. that we got in the FBI. And his the his the manager of that field office told him, "Don't be getting into anything off duty. It, it's not. Right. It doesn't. It's not the same as like in Virginia. They make everybody who's right. you know, federal, state, whatever. You have you know you're a lawman. That's right. it. It makes sense. Right. Right. And but some states aren't like that. Some states get real, you know, annoying with that stuff. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, like here, well, I'm in Florida right now, and in Florida, it's not a problem. We all have peace officer status. When I was on the job. But like in New Jersey, it's a big problem. You have to, be, you know, you have to be careful in New Jersey. They're a little more liberal on stuff and a little tighter with the with the situation with law enforcement carrying weapons from out of state. Yeah, I, I remember that. I went, to, I had to, went to a uh, wedding there, and now I'm active on the job and you know Leosa right. and and the federal yeah. carry thing, and they're like, I met a guy at the wedding, and he's like, because you know I have brought my piece with me. I'm not going to go that right. far away without having a gun. And right, he's right. like, Hey, you know, are you, do you have hollow points in there? I'm like, yeah, it's just a duty. It's issued by my police department. He's like, yeah, that's uh, those don't fly here. You better um, not get caught with those hollow points. It's a felony. I'm like, right. what? But they're, yeah, they're, that's insane. They're police bullets. They're like, it doesn't matter. Right. You got to have round, you know, hardball. I'm like, yeah, that's insane, man. I don't, I don't get that. I just don't understand that. Yeah. And the people making the decisions too, are not like, they're not gun right. people, so they're like like a hollow right. point go with mushrooms and it limits penetration. Absolutely, you have the Absolutely. hardball. You could go through somebody and go through somebody else. Oh, right. It's like right. they think all the people in Washington that are like not gun people or, or uh, far in the left. They think that hollow points explode and they're like it blows. Right. Right. <laughs> they blow armies. The I think it's like the movies. Yeah. yeah, I wish they exploded. They just go. You know, <laughs> right. right, right. It's right. ridiculous. So you were at uh, at customs. And mm-hmm. did you work with our mutual friend, Bob Starkman at all? Or is that where you met him? I did. I had the honor of working with Bobby. In fact, when I, I did a lot. When I was with ATF, I did a lot, a lot on the cover work. I bought, I did on the cover case. I did murder for hire cases where I got hired as a hitman to kill a, a family of four. Oh, my goodness. And so I had done all this on the cover, buying guns and drugs and ATF. And um, I was, um, that's one of the reasons I got hired with customs, actually. So, um, because my, the old, my old boss was connected somehow with customs. He had some type of a hook and he was able to get me in over there and they needed an undercover at the time to come in to, uh, to take over this import export business that I would be the main undercover on. Um, so it just so happens that, um, <laughs> that Bobby was in my group, Bob Starkman. So my first day I'm coming from New York. It's my first day. I have a pinstripe suit. I have my gold tee. And, and he, uh, you know, he looks at me, uh, this guy that was in that group who was a moron, you know, he's yeah. just a moron. He's there and he sees me and, and he looks and he smirks. He goes, who the F is this guy? To me, in front of everybody. Oh, and I geez, said, nice guy. I said, yeah, I said, well, my name's uh, Lorenzo Toledo. I'm the new ASAC, which is equivalent to like a deputy chief. I said, I'm the new deputy chief here. <laughs> and who the F are you? So the guy apologized to me, and he was freaking out, and, and then Bobby just started laughing when I told him who I really was. I mean, he just <laughs> he and, and we were friends ever since that day. You that's know? awesome. That's yeah, awesome. Bobby's a, Bobby's a great. He's Bobby's one of the few guys that's real loyal. Yeah, and you know that if you got to go through a door, he's going to be there with you. You know. Yeah, I was I was excited to have him on because yeah. uh, I know next I knew next to nothing about customs. And right. like there's undercover work, there's buying. I oh, mean, man. Yeah. people just don't know. They don't know. And I didn't know when I went from ATF to customs, I was like, customs, what am I going to do in customs, you know? Right. And it's funny, the biggest payment that I ever made to a CI when I was with ATF, I want to say $5,000. And that was, I, that took like, you know, I had to go all the way up the chain to get that. My first payment that I, it wasn't even my CI, I was just there as a witness. They were paying some guy $250,000. Oh. And I was like, what? I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I, Cause I had to sign the receipt and he must I have been good. It. Oh, he was really good. He was really good, but still I couldn't believe it. You know? So customs, customs was amazing. It really was. That's insane. It, yeah. And I, and I was blessed to have a great supervisor. I had a guy named Carlos Maza who was real. He was a former Marine, a former New Orleans cop, um, real proactive. And he, uh, he got me, he gave me a lot of rain to do my undercover work in there, and, and we were shipping containers to South America, and, and these dopers would fill them in. They would fill them uh, cocaine and stuff in the false tops that we had. Yeah, we would take out the cocaine when it got in, and then I would turn it into the bad guys in my warehouse, and then we'd we'd arrest them. So yeah. it was good stuff, good times. It's got to be intense, man, being undercover. It is, man. It is. It really is. You know, the worst feeling in the world is when you see 
all your SWAT guys, all the buff gym guys, you know, the big guys, you know, and with all the tattoos and, but they're all wearing our body armor. They got the helmets and they got machine guns. And, you know, you know, that if, if, if you know, if something happens, if it goes bad, it's going to be too late. Yeah. You know, you're on your own in there. You, you gotta, you gotta hope and pray that, that you have enough uh, wherewithal to make sure that you survive. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that that was the toughest part. And and I know that I've shared this with other undercovers. One of the recurring nightmares that a lot of undercovers have is that something bad happens during an undercover. And when they pull their gun out, the gun doesn't fire. And I, oh. I've actually discussed that with other undercover agents and they, they have similar dreams to that. So it's tough. It's, it's, it's tough. It really is. Yeah. Even if you're undercover and like you're doing a good job and then like someone asks you a weird question, and they start looking at you weird. You got to think yeah. like, is this it? Like him, right? Or is, right. is he just in a mood? Or is he doing right? You know, like I don't know, man. I yeah. I was a um, local copper on uh, the Cape and Mass in the beginning of my career, and I did like right. a couple like tiny buys, like stolen property stuff. Right. And I remember I did one right. like behind an old building, and um, the state police were involved, and the guy was like, I wasn't thinking. I was on a midnight guy, so they're like, hey, grab a midnight right. guy, and you know. Tell him not to shave for a few days. Put put a Carhartt jacket on him. Give him a van. You know, like right, hey, right. I'm a local uh, painter. Um, and then right before we did it, the the trooper was like, um, "Just a good rule of thumb. I know you got your piece and all that." He goes, "Just run, run." I'm like, "What do you mean run?" Right. He's like, "He's like if something goes wrong." He goes, "All they know about you is you're showing up with 500 bucks and you're meeting behind an old building. Right. So they know you yeah. have money, and these are right. drug addicts. So, yeah. and I was like, That's right great before advice. I did, yeah, and yeah. this is a big tough guy, and he's like Steve. Yeah, that's great advice. He goes, I always wear yeah. sneakers; just it's not worth it. And right. um, <laughs> it kind of freaked me out though because I was all excited, but then I was like, "Oh wait, I could get attacked." Yeah, yeah, because you're a kid. Real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 to, like, what I would do in my in my um, in my warehouse was I had I had strategic places that I would I had planned to to hide in or to dive in if something happened. Yeah. You know? So I would have to orchestrate everything. So so when it was time to make the arrest, that I would reach out to my cover team to come in, or they would tell me, "Hey, we're coming in." I had to strategically plan that the bad guys' backs were to the door that they were coming through. So yeah. I almost had to orchestrate that, you know. And and, and, <laughs> and you know what I would do? I would get behind my desk, and behind my desk, I had Kevlar, you know, oh, so yeah. so that I can just drop and let these guys do what they uh, what they had to do. Be like, hey guys, uh, I want to take a group picture. Could you all just move over? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Oh man, did you ever get yeah. in a situation undercover where, like, you're um, someone's just inquisitive and they're like asking like about your backstory, about who you are, and like you, you start painting Absolutely. this this mural, and you're like, oh man, I gotta like remember I said that. This has got to check. You start painting this web yeah. of right. this fake story. That's got to be nerve wracking. Right. It is. I mean, one of the things that that I was taught was to try to make it. You know, obviously, you got to come up with a story, but make a story that you, you can be very familiar with. For example, my name on the my name's Lorenzo, right? But my undercover name was Lazaro, and uh, you know, and I I played it off. I was from you know, I just moved here to Miami from New York, and so if anybody asked me, I could I could respond to them and give them the answers. Um, another thing that I did was I never tried to act like the tough guy or the bad guy. I was just a businessman trying to make money. Because what happens is a lot of these undercovers, they want to look so bad and tough that what they're actually doing is they're escalating the problem. Yeah. And, and what I want to do is I want to de-escalate the problem. I don't want them, to, you know, you can't be a pushover, but you don't want to be a threat either, you know. And, and that's one of the things that I that I see sometimes with undercovers, that they want to look so tough. And by the way, I did that too. I'm, I'm guilty of it. In ATF, I, I had gold teeth that I had made and um, I had different stuff that I would use, but... Um, with customs, it was different because I was dealing with a t different, a different level of dopers, you know, a higher level of, you know, dopers. So it was different. I didn't need to have the gold teeth or the tattoo or in, in New Jersey, I had an arrest record. I, you know, I had, I had a social security card. I had everything. I, I had, I would go into the probation for the, for the urine tests that I would go in and I would sit there with all the other, you know, convicts yeah. and talk to them. And it's funny how much information and intel you get just sitting there, you know? Oh yeah, but, um, you're one of the. So I had all this record. Yeah, I had all that from New Jersey from doing undercover. So I brought that with me to to Miami. Man, I, I, we had um, I had uh, Joe Pistone on the show. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. a year or so ago, and uh, right. he, he talking about being tough. He got yeah. taken into a back room, like locking the right. door style, and mm -hmm. um, 
it was like the only thing he could do to think of was like he just decked this because they were accusing him, you know? Right. But he had right. enough of a relationship with them that they like, you know, they didn't think he was, you know, yeah. a, a cop. And that's what he did. He just decked this like a, a not made guy because he knew he could right. do that. And then he knew right. he would get a beating. But then at yeah. least it looked like, oh, this guy doesn't care at all. Like this, he's, right. he's a madman. When he was telling the right. story, I was like sweating. I was like, oh, how could yeah. you do that, dude? Yeah. Yeah, Pistone's book, which I read in Young, was like one of the Bibles I read for how to do undercover work. Yeah. He's a super uh, mentor to a lot of the undercovers, the younger undercovers, because he was able to do a long-term undercover. You know, doing long-term undercover has to be the hardest of all. Like, I, oh. I did it in my warehouse, but it's nowhere near what Joe Pistone did. Um, you know, so he's uh, he's amazing. The, guy, the guy's one of a kind, you know. And it's just funny because, as you see, the agency at the end of the day, you know, chewed him up and spit him out, you know? Right. He, he never became a sack, a cheat, you know, he, he, he just don't move up, you know? Yeah. So when your time is over, all you have most of the time is a broken family. Right. And, 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 and a lot of regrets, you know, and, and it's hard. It's, you know, we still love the job and we love what we do, but it's hard, you know? Yeah. I did a cop. I did a, I did a corrupt cop in Patterson, New Jersey. And he was selling uh, guns. He would take guns off people and he would sell them. He was a white supremacist, Ugh. and um, I was going to sell him a machine gun. And when I went to Patterson, New Jersey, which is a real tough town, he came up. He showed up in uniform. He was a lieutenant there. He showed up in uniform. He patted me down in the local McDonald's. Ballsy. Yeah, crazy, man. And they wanted me to wear a wire for that case, and I refused to wear a wire. I said, I'm not going to wear a wire with a cop. If something happens and he finds that wire, I don't know what he'll do. I don't know what his reaction will be. Yeah, he's so dirty. I, I thank God. I, yeah, thank God I didn't wear one. Thank God, you know. But but it's um, undercover work is hard, and one of the things that people don't realize is, you know, you still have to live after you do your undercover assignments. Yeah. I've ran into people I've arrested before. That's you know, <laughs> and, you know, they're out of jail now, and they see you. Yeah, and you don't know how they're going to react, and you have to almost approach them so that they know you're not scared or intimidated. Yeah. Because if you start, you know, freaking out or, or showing some kind of fear, they're going to jump all over it. Man, so you're are you still around that area? I'm still in the area. I have I I've only ran into two guys, and I never had a problem with either guy. But I approached them. I said, "Hey, how you doing? Remember me?" Because yeah. I know they looked at me, and I yeah. knew they knew who I was. So when I said that, they were like, "Yeah, yeah, hey, you're okay. How you doing? You know, like that. Talk to them. You know." And I've never had an issue after that. Yeah, it makes it make it a lot harder for them to do something once they like humanize right. you. They okay, right. he's just a guy doing a job. They know they know and they're. I bad. tell them, and, and you know what, Steve? I've never treated anybody disrespectfully. You know, I always treated people with respect, and I say, "Hey, look, look, you know, you had the nice cars, you had the nice jewelry, you had the nice, you got caught. You know the game, right? You know, it's the Smuggler's Blues, right? The famous song. I mean, you know, now it's time to pay the piper. Yeah. You know, that's the way it works. I mean, it, my dad and, told me and that. They all, yeah. And, and they all, you know, it's funny. They all cooperate. They all talk. Yeah. I, I only had one person that he was a member of the outlaws motorcycle gang that um, he was selling guns. He was receiving guns at his house. He's the only guy ever that didn't testify. He said, I'm not, I'm, I'm, he was a tattoo artist. So he said, you know what? I just got out of jail. I'll go back. I'm fine in jail. He had just done like 10 years. Oh, he says, I'm not giving anybody up. I'm no rat. He's the only guy that I ever, in all my years, worked with that didn't give somebody up. Even the mob guys. Even the mob guys. They all talk. They're not the same as, you know, I think Gotti, Gotti was the last of the Mohicans. Yeah. Know? It's, it's got to be a lot harder, too, when it's like close family you, you have to turn right. on. And you know what happens? That people start realizing, wait a minute, when I go to jail, what happens? These same guys that were your friends will forget about you. These same guys will try to hit on your wife or your girlfriend. Right. You know, and, and, you know, so, and most of the time, these same guys are the ones that put you in jail. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're not going to so go. It's insane. They're not going for you. Exactly. You know? Damn, man. Lorenzo, do you have a, um, in your memory, do you have a, the first um, intense or hot call, let's call it, that you dealt with as an agent or cop or take your pick? Trying to think, man, of the hot calls. I mean, I I didn't have the pleasure of being a uniform cop, but I remember the search warrants that we would do. This is funny when I st when I did my first search warrant in a with ATF, I did it in an area called Washington Heights, 
which is a primarily Dominican area. A lot of drug trafficking goes, goes on there. And to get there, I'm talking about the times of the pagers, the beepers, and those yeah. brick cell phones, right? Yeah. So what we would have to do is we would have to go into a building that was around the corner, right? They would send four or five Spanish guys. We would go to a building that was maybe four or five blocks. I'm sorry, now around the corner from the block of the building we we're going to hit. Then we had to jump two rooftops. Oh, it's like a movie. You know, <laughs> like a movie. We would have to jump two rooftops to get to that building and then go, you know, gear up on the, on the roof, right? And then go down and stand by the by this top stairway so that when the, when, when the teams would come up, we would all be there together at the same time. And the reason for that was the minute that we hit a place, you would see the pages go off. And, and you see 911, 911, 911. All the pages were going right. off every. And so that was one of the first things I saw. A lot of times the guys would run out. They knew the cops were coming down, and we would be in the next flight of steps, you know, on the next floor. And we would take them down like that. Um, I had a lot of hairy, really close calls. Damn. We had a, we had a couple of uh, almost, almost killed a guy um, who was a home invader. And um, he had burned the woman with an iron. He had raped her. And we oh. found out where he was. And me and my old partner, um, this is a crazy story. This is when I was with the prosecutors. I go there. We go to find the guy. We, we bring along the local police department. And three guys come with us. And the guy opens the door, but he only cracks it open halfway. And he's got a little kid. And he's got his hands hidden behind so we can't see his hand we don't know what he has in his hands right so we draw our weapons and the minute we draw our weapons and we get into a, a, a verbal altercation with this individual the three uniform guys we had they left us there what they left us there so now it's me and my partner we're, we're like we're just waiting to see anything and, you know uh, the flash of a gun and, and we remember we have this guy's holding a little kid um why did the cops like, leave lorenzo I don't know, Max. to this day i don't know I don't know. They just left us there. Jeez. They, li- they literally ran down the stairs and took off. I'll <laughs> never awful. forget that. Awful. Yeah. yeah, it was horrible. Horrible. So they leave us. And then um, luckily, you know, thank God, the guy decided to open the door and we took him in. And, and the guy was so bad that down the road, he ended up killing a CI that we had. Wow. Yeah. And he ended up doing, he ended up getting like 25 years in jail. But the guy was real bad. He was a real bad guy, you know, and uh that was one of a couple of real close calls that I had to killing somebody. I, I, I'm very fortunate that I never had to shoot anybody. I feel blessed um, yeah. that I never had to do that. And uh, so, um, yeah, you know, I've been shot at, but I never had to shoot anybody. <laughs> that, that is a blessing. I, I worked with the guy's yes. backgrounds over um, when I was in L.A. And he mm-hmm. was he had been a uh, ran a gang table for um, the right. police, you know, and he uh, he was in same with him. He was, I mean, okay. everybody around us, it seems like in LAPD background, some guys, even from the smaller cities had shot five or six people. I mean, just yeah. people shoot a lot faster on the West coast. Right. Um, right. They, they just do. And he had not shot any he, whole career, 30 years. And he was a right. badass. Like he did yeah. a million calls and he's like, he like almost felt guilty about it. He's like, I, didn't, I just right. never had right. to, you know, he's like, yeah, but now he's lucky. Yeah. He's, he's very lucky, lucky. man. Extremely. Yeah. And, lucky. I, and I feel again, I feel blessed that I didn't have to do that because you know, some people think it's cool, you know, people that don't know the job, but yeah. they don't know what happens after the shooting and what what goes through your mind. And, you know, we're good people. Cops are good people. We don't want to hurt anybody. We want to help people. Right. Some of these bad guys, all they want to do is hurt people. So they have a different mindset than we have. Yeah. You know? Damn, man. It, so that job for New Jersey, that was... um. You said you worked for like the DA's office or something? It was a county prosecutor's office. I was a senior detective there. Okay, interesting. So they're yeah. and like they're in, they're in Hackensack, New Jersey. Okay, so like in Mass, they have we have um, district attorney's office, obviously, and then ADAs that help the that run the office. But they're um, they have troopers assigned. Mm-hmm. They don't. We don't have any kind of like. I know some states have like. They actually have their own DAs and and yeah. investigative. So you were a part of the like de- detectives units attached. Right. Yes, yes. That's a pretty badass yeah, job. Did, it was fun. I mean, we did everything. We did. I was in narcotics. I was in vice. I was in all organized crime. I was in sex crimes. I was in uh, those. Well, that's it. Yeah, no, those are the only groups I can remember that I was in. I was in stolen. We did. We did this huge operation with a stolen car ring, 
And uh, it was awesome. It, it was awesome what we did, you know. Um, and we recovered a bunch of guns. We, you know, you could, anything you could think of, including the, about 55 cars, we recovered. I mean, guns, drugs, you name it, TVs, everything. And we, we, we were able to recover there. And it was a lot of fun because it was me, a biker, and my partner that ran the warehouse. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, we had a, we had, it was funny. We had this wall that had pictures of women, like naked women or whatever. Yep. And, and it was a, a micro camera, a little pinhole camera there. <laughs> so what we would do is we would walk over to the wall and say, wow, look at that girl. Look at that. And, she, and guys would put their faces. It was almost like a mugshot that we would get, you know? So oh, that, that was cool. I had a, I had a lot of fun. I, I learned, you know, I, I was blessed to work for some real good cops that taught me a lot. What were you- and then I was, also, I was also blessed to work with really bad cops that, that taught you a lot taught too. Me not, not to do and right. and um, and good supervisors that and bad supervisors, but good supervisors that taught me that the most important thing is to look out for your guys. Yeah, and and I was a supervisor for seventeen years, and um, that was always been my you know the way I feel. You know, supervisors are there to help their guys. You know, when they do well. They give the credit to the group. When something happens bad, it's on you. That's what you're there for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's funny too. There, so many guys come out of like in the police yeah. world, come out of patrol, and get mm-hmm. into supervision or, or higher admin. And it's like it's like that brain reset where it's like they right. were never a patrolman, and all of a sudden it's right. like they're just they they don't stand behind you. The person walks through the lobby, right. they complain about you, and they're like, "What did you do?" You're right, like, "Wait a right. second, don't you know me personally? Yeah. I would never do that." Yeah, they right. immediately take. It, it, it's amazing, man. It's like heavy lies the head that wears the crown, you know. Yeah, a lot of times that that power or that that presumed power because it's not really power goes to their head, and they they can't handle it, you know. And it's it's a shame because you shouldn't change who you are. You should be the same person. Yeah, that coupled right? with their I mean, they're like negotiating now they're out of the union for us, right? And they're negotiating their own deal with the town, and they only get three years at a time. So I think they feel like. I really got to, you know, kiss the public's ass here. Right, right, yeah. Otherwise, I could get canned, you know. Yeah, that's a shame, man, because then, again, but that happens everywhere, as we all know. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's the ugly part of the job, you know. Really, we're just here to to help people, man. When you could do something where you help somebody, that's the best thing in the world, you know. And, and I, what I love about my career is that it's taken me to so many different, you know, places, overseas and undercover investigations overseas and, and uh you know, meeting different people, different agents, meet, meeting different cops, task forces. I even got a stint to be a, in Hollywood based on on the cover work that I did. I, I had the opportunity to work with Michael Mann and oh, really? Colin Farrell. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was um, myself and Alex Alonzo, my old boss, who was also a phenomenal on the cover. We were selected to um, teach Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx how to work on the cover. How's Jamie Foxx? He's got to be a great guy. He is, man. He's a, he's a good guy. Colin Farrell is amazing. Colin Farrell. Both of them were nice guys. I just gravitated a little more to uh, to Colin Farrell. He's Irish, right? He, he's Irish, but what a great guy he is, you know? And again, Jamie Foxx was a good guy as well. But um, so what myself and Alex did is we put a school together, an, under, an undercover school uh, for these guys. And towards the end, you know, um, especially, um, especially uh, what's his name? Colin Farrell. He's doing really good. And he was getting really arrogant and cocky. <laughs> he thought he was an undercover guy already, you know? Yep. So Michael Mann approaches me and says, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you make him think that he's actually going to do a reel on the cover? And I said, sure, I can put something together. So I spoke to my boss. <laughs> and what we did was we videotaped. We had footage from old cases, you know, surveillance pictures. And we did this whole thing. We took some pictures of our – I took some pictures of Alex Alonzo. So he was going to be one of the bad guys. I was uh, – I was um, – Colin's partner in the undercover. So, you know, I told him, hey, these Colombian guys are coming. They're just going to pick up a couple, six kilos, I think it was. And um, so he's like, I don't, you know, we tell him, I, Michael Mann asked me, hey, you know, so you think you think um, Colin Farrell could do it? Do you think he's good? For it? I go, yeah, he's done real good in the school. I don't see why not. And he tried to get out of it. He goes, no, no, I can't do it. You know, he goes, uh, <laughs> they, they're going to recognize me. I go, dude, these guys are Colombians. They're not going to know who you are. Yeah. You know? You know, so then he said, um, he said, okay, I'll do it, you know. So we set up the warehouse. We did everything. And, and when we get in there um, to do the undercover, he's all pumped up. And everything's oh, on bet. video. There's, there's actually a, a YouTube video. It's called Miami Vice Undercover that you can watch that shows this whole thing happen, you know. Oh, really? So, so the whole training, yeah. So what happens is 
we had one of the guys that we, one of the bad guys that we had that was also an undercover. He starts just staring at him, and he gives him the death stare. And Colin Farrell <laughs> doesn't know what to do. So then he's like, Alex tells him, how do I know you're not a cop? How do I know you're not a cop? And he goes, I'm not a cop. And he goes, how do I know you're not a cop? So he opens up his shirt. He goes, look, I'm not a cop. I'm not a cop, you know? So, <laughs> make a, you know, the whole thing, you know, everything goes out. There's a huge argument there. He's freaking out. If you see his face, he's white, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> he, uh, he's freaking out. And then they leave, and he hugs me. And this is all in the video. He hugs me, and he does everything. Oh, my God, Lorenzo, amazing. So that night, about 3 in the morning, he calls Michael Mann, and he says, hey, man, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. Oh, no. So, so Michael Mann calls my boss, our, our boss, my boss, and Alex's boss, and says, hey, guys, I'm just going to go ahead and tell him. This guy's, this guy's having, like, a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so then they told him that he got punked. Uh... And he goes, oh, these guys. And then in, even on the, in, in the Miami Vice on the cover video, he says, I got punked. These guys got me. So, you know, it's funny how That's that led awesome. to uh, – yeah, it was awesome. It, it was a great experience for us. And, and you know, it, Michael Mann is amazing. He really is an amazing director. He wants to use the, the, the best of the best. And, and it was a, it was impressive to be on a movie set and to see the amount of money those people have to throw away. Oh, you I know. know? It's yeah. sickening. Oh, my God. Like, I, so every day I'd be working there in the movie set. I'd be there like 15 hours. And then I'd go home and my wife would tell me, throw out the garbage. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm right back to being Lorenzo, the, you know, the slave. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. When I was doing insurance yeah. investigations, I interviewed one of the, the, the head Teamster guys that moved their equipment for shooting movies. Mm -hmm. And right. he would just gotten back from uh, Hawaii. He said, we, right. he goes, the studio just paid $12 million to get us to Hawaii. All these tractor trailers, all this stuff. Yeah. Then yeah. Ben Affleck was the, supposed to be the person for this role. Mm -hmm. Went into rehab. We all came back. Wow. So it was like $20 million. Nothing was accomplished. And I was like, right. that's some money. Yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to go to the um, uh, Dominican Republic, but then something happened where some security guy shot somebody on set. Oh. So uh, Jamie Foxx said, I'm not filming that over there. So everybody came back to, to Miami. Good call. So we, yeah. yeah. But we, got a, we were walking around. We were shooting thousands of rounds in blanks, right? And in Miami, there was a call of shots fired, so the cops were heading towards us. So he, he or me and Alex are walking down Miami looking like drug dealers, holding, you know, AR-15s or uh, Uzis or whatever we had at the time. And we had to run into <laughs> to hide so they wouldn't shoot us, you know, thinking that we were bad guys. Yeah. Geez, my, a buddy of mine, um, I went to high school with Manages Nitro Circus, that, you know, mm -hmm. extreme sports stuff. Right, right. And, uh, so he travels all around the world. So I saw one picture of him on Facebook. He's in South America. And uh, he's standing in front of this little store, and there's a guy, like, you know, their police there look like military. He's wearing, like, OD green right, right, with a yeah. hat, with a holster, like an old brown holster that looked like it was, you know, right. 100 years old. And the guy's um, pointing his gun at his head in the picture, like, for a joke. Oh, my God. And I'm like, this is, that's not funny. I mean, he's got this old yeah, World War II revolver <laughs> sticking it in my buddy's head, and he's like. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, like, oh, these man. guys will do anything. Oh, man. <laughs> They'll do anything. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, you know, luckily the job has, has opened a lot of avenues for me and exposed me to a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. I went ahead and did some, some pictures and movies after that. So did Alex. Uh, we, we had a little sp uh, spurt of fame there. We did a couple of five lines and under movies. And yeah, that's awesome. Program. And um, and then, uh, you know, after I, my last six years with uh, Homeland, I was running the gang group. I was the supervisor for the Violent Gang Task Force in Miami. And that was amazing. You know, I was going out there and it was dangerous, and it, but it was fun. You know, I had, a, I had a, I loved the team I had. I just had a bunch of alpha males yeah. that I had to harness, though. I, I, would, I would have to, guys, I used to tell them, I go, guys, remember that this job, you can love the job, but it will never love you back. Yeah. You know, and, and that's something that I, that I remember. An NYPD cop told me that and I never forgot that, you know. Yeah, they told us um, in the academy, they said, you're not going to get many backpats. Right, right, and that's the problem, man. You, you, you know, you got to be careful. You got to be smart, you know, and and that's what I always try to impart on my group. It's just, you know, just be smart about what you do. You know, just don't go out there because they're gonna they're gonna throw you under the bus. You're gonna end up losing your your pension and your career. Yeah, like the border guys that were whipping migrants, right? On right. horses, it's, it's ridiculous, man. It, yeah. It's crazy, you know. And and unfortunately, especially now, I mean. Um, you know, the cops are uh, cops are you know they they can't do their job. They're 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 handcuffed. You know, and it's 
And as we see, look at how much crime has gotten and all the things that are happening now. That that lack of respect for law enforcement has affected society. Oh, yeah. It's, it's awful. You I know? mean, even I work in a rural area and it's like right. you can't like being a cop isn't like it's like the 70s all over again. Like being a cop is dumb. It's not cool. Right. It's like right. Right. it's like the yeah. it's a reverse of what happened after 9-11 where it was right. like everybody was patriotic and law enforcement. Right. Fired. Right. It's yeah. like the uh, it's the opposite. Like you can't. You can't get people even to get in, like for just like low key police jobs, right? No, and no. I'll tell you, Steve, my my biggest regret in life is that I didn't go to the military. I would have loved to gone to the to, to before, and and the only reason I didn't go is because I got hired so fast with the marshals. Yeah, but if not, I, I was dying to get into the military. And now that I'm I'm you know I'm sixty, turning sixty one soon, it's like you know, it's not much I can do now, you know. Yeah, but it I might really be a little bit over I the age. That. I'm over you. I'm a little over, just a little bit. <laughs> you would have loved it, man. We I had um, Michael Brown. He works for um, mm-hmm. Rigaku, which is a company that makes the machines where, like, if we get a scene, we have like one in our county. If we get a scene with a bunch of liquids, and we're like, "Is this GHB? Is this meth?" Like, we don't know. What are they right, cooking? Right. They have a machine right. you can kind of stick the thing in, and it tells you there's a database in it. Well, right. He's like a. Uh, executive for them now but he came on the show and he was uh i think he was dea and like you would have loved it like he they were literally set charges and take off from a landing strip in columbia and watch it blow up right they're shooting people out of the plane i mean just insane stuff that's awesome but you did that's awesome you did overseas stuff what is it like working with like another country it's different man and and again you know when you're working another you're at the mercy of that that law the law enforcement personnel that they have right they're like the lead so, right they have to be they're the lead you don't you you have nothing so yeah you work with the embassy guys and you have some of your guys there but mostly you're using the vetting units that the embassies use to cover you um and it's it's a lot more dangerous over there than it is here but what i always tell people is like when you were mentioning earlier, Steve, that you did some undercover, that the, that trooper told you to, to just run if something happens. Right. The, the problem with undercover is that you can be the best there is, and if it's just your time, you're gone. I mean, you're never gonna act, you're never gonna be able to react faster than action. You know. Right. So so there is no little undercover. It doesn't matter what you do. You know. Yeah. It, it can always go bad for you, and, and that's something that I always you know I always took you know to heart that. You know, I mean, there's guys that think, oh, no, undercover's just doing it. You know, you got to go real deep. It's really not. It's like anybody can get hurt doing undercover. Yeah. It only takes one second of you not thinking or not seeing something and you're done. That's it. It's over. It's a wrap, you know. It's a real so, talent yeah, so, to be able to do it, too. It's a skill set that not everybody can pull off. It's a skill set that not anybody can pull off. And, and but it affects you in the long term, because what happens is you, you're so you get so good at reading people. That after you retire, you're the same way. Yeah, I can't turn like, it off. You can't turn it off. Like my wife, my wife is. She tells me, "My God, you're so cynical." I mean, you're so negative. I go, "I'm not negative. It's just that I see things. I've seen too much. You know, <laughs> I've seen too much. You know, and yeah. I know how to read people. And, and it, you know, so it, it's hard. To, it, once you have it, you can't turn it off. You really can't. And, and once you're a cop, you're always a cop. You yeah. know, I always say, guys, don't understand. Even if you retire, you still bleed blue. You still have it in you. If something happens, you're going to be there to help. If yep. some, an officer on the side of the road and he's struggling with that guy, you're going to pull over. Right. Because that's what we do. Yep. You know, we're brothers. We're brothers in this and we, we help each other, you know? Absolutely. hundred percent. We, yeah. I mean, like you're saying about the um, undercover buying there, we had a guy that was um, a, just a reserve for us, but he was really right. good at it. So he, right. he was buying like dope and meth and stuff and he ended up not working for too long, but, um, he was just had such a knack for like small talking with like tweakers and stuff right. that he was successful all the time. He was, a uh, he was on Marine force recon and then he came, wow. tried out police stuff for a while, but right. you know, nerves of steel, you know, yeah, I'm not yeah. that guy. I was like buying like an old yeah. used chainsaw and I was like, <laughs> yeah, no, but you know what? It, it's, it's funny, man. It's, it's, um, how can I put it this way? Like, Sometimes, you know, the undercover has to fit the situation. Right. You know what I mean? Like maybe Joe Pistone couldn't do, couldn't go into the, to the Cubans in Miami. Right. He might've been killed, you know what I mean? Like, so everything fits different. And, and, and I, I, there's no way I could do what Pistone did. 
There's no way. He's like I said, he's a legend, you know. But um, and my my old supervisor from ATF, Dominic, who did the ice man, Kuklinski, those guys are, are amazing. I don't know how they did it, you know. Um, but it's 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 um, you have to fit the certain situation. You have to be able to fit in, right? You and Pistone was from that area. He knew he, he knew, knew those it. guys. Yeah, it has to be familiar with you, yeah. And he and he was he was very good at it. But he, he had an that, apartment you know? and a, yeah. like a different car. And he yeah. said, when I asked him, I said, what was the one thing in the movie that really like that aggravated you that was not accurate? And right. he said, I say this in every interview. I never hit my wife. Right. He's like, yeah. when he saw that on the big screen, he was like, right. what? Because then yeah, everybody they, 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 in his they, life is like, oh, my, we didn't know you used to beat up Cindy right. or right. whatever. And he was like, I right. didn't. I didn't do that. Right. They just take poet. You know, That's they, a shame, right? That's a shame that they would do that, you know, just for the movie. Yeah. Not. You know? and, and 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 that's the thing. I mean, you know, being under the cover, you know, there's no you're not working nine to five because these CIs are, and these bad guys are calling you at 10, 11, 12, one o'clock in the morning and you better pick up or you don't have to pick up. But I'm saying you have to play the role. So you got it most of the time. You're going to do a deal the next day. They call and you got to answer the phone. Ugh, yeah. You know, so there's no there's no breaks or, you know, how are the crazy. how are the feds with um like overtime, like how does it, do you just have like stipends, like your undercover stipend, this stipend, like they can't be paying no. you overtime for all this extra stuff. You'd be, they don't pay at all. We, we used to get 25% of our salary included in our pay. That's what it is. Okay. But, but you don't get overtime. Like, you know, it's like if you go over a hundred hours, it doesn't matter. That's all you're going to get. Gotcha. And what about you travel? Know? Is that covered in the 25%? Yeah. Tra- travel's covered. Travel's covered. Okay. You get a per diem, so you get like meals and and you know, and things you you know if you need a car rental, they pay for it. Incidentals and meals that that's covered. That's covered. But besides but that, yeah, you're not going to become rich, right? I mean, doing our job, that's for sure. You know, no, not at all. I mean, but you know, you look like you're saying about working for the county, making a lot of money. You can yeah. if you if you Google search some right. county or or state agencies like. Right. There are just road guys making like two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. Absolutely. It's absolutely right. <laughs> what? Yeah, my old my old buddy he was the, my best friend. He ended up being the chief in the prosecutor's office. And I think he was making two forty when he left. You know? Nothing wrong with that. I don't make when I retired from the feds after after thirty years I didn't make that kind of money. Damn. You know? Two forty. It's crazy. Yeah. That's nuts. He, he that, did good for himself. We had on, on the Cape when I worked there the uh Chatham, I don't know if you ever heard of it, it was a very posh community. Mm-hmm. Um they shot like that Coast Guard movie there with Nick Pine, but um, mm-hmm. the the town administrator went out and the chief of police was already, he, he's making like a buck sixty, and then they said, hey, you know, would you want to step in and be town administrator till we find a new one? He's like, sure, yeah. five hundred bucks a day. They're like, all right. So this guy for like three years is being cha- paid as a chief of police and making another wow. five hundred a day. That's to be, amazing to be the town administrator, and then finally they That's they said to him, "Listen, you gotta you gotta pick one. We like you as e- yeah, as either one. Right? It's too much. We're paying you too much money. <laughs> yeah, this is, right. This, this doesn't look good. Yeah, I hear you, brother. So Lorenzo, what is uh? I mean, you're a man with a lot of stories. Um, can you pick one that you would categorize as like your like a extremely intense or terrifying moment from your career? <laughs> I have a I have a couple, but I'll give you two, and I'll make them as quick as possible. No, t- um, take your time, brother. Yeah, we were when I was working with ATF. We had a case where um, I was selling guns to this guy who who no, I'm sorry, I was buying guns from a guy who worked at an army barracks in Pennsylvania or some kind of military ba- barracks in Pennsylvania. So I was in Jersey. I was flying. O- I was driving over there, and he he would sell us guns. He sold us a couple guns. And the guy disappeared from the face of the earth. We didn't see him for about four or five months. So I had he, I had an undercover phone at work, you know, a hard line. Um, one day I get a collect call from jail, from this little jail in Pennsylvania, and it's the guy. And he's like, hey, I need to see you. Um, you know, can you visit me? I'm here in this jail. And I'm like, what do you want? You know, and he's like, I got to talk to you, something really important, right? So myself and my partner, we go up there. We go to this jail about an hour, hour and a half away. And when we get there, he tells us, listen, he lived in a trailer park. He goes, I just, I just, I got drunk the other day. I went to a strip club. My neighbor's a stripper there and she came on to me. And when I got back home, I was drunk and I broke into her her trailer and I raped her. 
Oh. You know, is what he tells me. And, and you know, she's she she got me arrested, and I can't do the time. He says I can't do the time. And I go, what do you want me to do? And he says, I want you to kill her. Oh. I want you to kill her, and I want you to kill the kids and their husband. Oh my gosh! So I said, look, man, I you know, send me a letter. Send me a letter. I got a PO box. Send me a letter. Tell me what you want me to do. How we're gonna do? What what is it that you want? You know. So to make a long story short, the guy actually writes me a letter. What a dummy! Telling me how he wants me to put a grenade in, next to the propane tanks on the trailer oh. and just kill everybody in the in the place, right? So he ends up sending us. I told him I needed money up front. I, th- I think I was going to charge him two thousand or four thousand. I forgot how much it was. Something he could pay, <laughs> right? Something he could pay because that's that's the act that we needed, right? Right. To, in front of the crime, right? So the guy sends he sends his girlfriend, some girlfriend. To meet me and my partner at this parking lot, and and the girl the whole time that we meet, she has her hand in her pocket, and you could just see the the image of a, the barrel of a gun. And she is super nervous. I mean, she is terrified, but she's got this gun pointing us the whole time. So as we're talking to her, um, my partner opens the trunk of his car, and the alarm goes off. And I could just see in this woman's eyes that she was about to shoot. Us. Oh. She was just. She just, you know, she freaked out. She yeah. didn't know what to do. And I'm like, whoa, calm down. Relax. Like, well, nothing's going to happen, you know? Take it easy. So we ended up um, doing like a fake uh, murder scene. And we took pictures of the of the victims. Really? And, you know, showing, yeah. So we did that. I went back to the jail. I showed the guys the pictures. And he was happy, right? And then, obviously, we ended up arresting him. He ended up getting 20 years. He pled guilty to it. He didn't go to trial. But, um... That was rewarding for me because I got to see the kids, you know. Yeah, I got to see their faces, and it was nice to know that I had a, I had something to do with saving people's lives, you know. Yeah, and and, and the other biggest case, that, I mean, the case, that's not the biggest case, but the case but that's that an I remember, insane story, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Damn, um, it was funny because I was supposed to be my partner and I were supposed to be on the Sally Jesse Raphael show. Yeah, it was some popular show on TV with this woman that wore red glasses. Yep. But but ATF wouldn't let me do it at the time. Ah, uh. so so yeah, that was that was one of the bigger cases that I'll never forget. And, and the second one I had was when I worked sex crimes in Bergen County. Um, we had this guy who was a merchant marine. I never forget this guy because he had a he had a tattoo of a of a snake, ro- ro- you know, wrapped around his arm. He was a big guy, you know, and his wife was like the local old woman who would take care of all the kids in this neighborhood in Jersey, you know. So. What did he do? While his wife did that, he would he made this room in his closet, and he would have like brothers and sisters perform sexual acts, oh. and he molested dozens and dozens of kids. So, you know, we had one kid go f- come forward, tell us about it, and then we put it on the in the paper, and all of a sudden, more kids came forward, and more people wanted to testify, you know, and so we we went to go arrest the guy, and he had his door open, and he was he was a uh, painting. So when we go in, me and my partner, he runs to the back of the of the of his bedroom, and as he's back there, I, I have my gun fire, you know, I have my gun in the ready, and I was about to light this guy up. Uh, my partner tackles him, you know, and grabs him. And what he was doing, he was grabbing a, a, a short barrel shotgun Oof. that he had hidden on his bedpost, you know. And uh, I told him, I said, "Man, you want to?" I told the guy, "You want to do it again? Let's do it over again." Yeah. I, I said, "Just grab the gun, you know, grab that gun." Because I wanted to kill the guy. I'll be honest with you. I, I really wanted to kill the I guy. Blame I, saw, I, I had to interview all these kids, and I knew what he oh did to those gosh. kids. So it, it, I had two. I had twin boys, and you know, I had four kids of my own, and, and it, it broke my heart. You know, and uh, the good thing is that the guy went to trial, and the day of his trial, he ended up having a massive heart attack on the steps of uh, the courthouse, and he passed away a week later. Good, and he died. You know, but I, I would have liked him to do at least ten years and then die. Yeah, you know? yeah, pay but, a little um, bit. Yeah, and, and you know, the, that's one of the the you know the ones that I, that was um, the, the mean the, the most rewarding to me. You know, um, I did a case with with customs where I did an undercover. I had I did an undercover from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement who was selling. He had gotten fired from his job, and now he was he was he had imported a hundred kilos. Oh my gosh, he had the connection. Yeah, he had the connection with this other guy who had li- like literally just got out of jail the week before. Wow. So I had to be the undercover on this FDLE guy. 
So when we call FDLE, FDLE is the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. When we call them, they said, that guy used to be one of the best undercovers we had. So I'm mm-hmm. like, Jesus Christ, man. You know, now mm-hmm. now you have all the pressure on you to do this, right? Yeah. So when we're in there and we're in my warehouse, we're counting the kilos. We're counting the kilos. And he's smart. He doesn't touch any of the kilos. He doesn't get it. He lets the other guy count. He has a conversation with my partner. He's talking, talking, but he's not doing any of the count. So he can say, hey, I don't know what's in there. Yeah. You know? So what I did was I took one of the kilos and I tossed it at him. And I go, look how, look how good this is packaged. And he grabbed it. And he's like, oh, yeah, wow, that, that's good. He's like, that damn was it. it. I had him, you know. I had him. <laughs> so that, that was rewarding too, you know. Oh, man. That's... I would say that nobody hates a dirty cop more than a cop. Yeah. A good cop, you know. Makes so that was good. Bad. Yes, exactly. So I'm sorry I'm so dark, man. I guess it got dark. Really. You're I don't getting know darker you and darker. <laughs> Yeah, it's, man. Let me let me turn the light. I'm sorry, bro. No, that's no problem. You sure? Yeah. It's, yeah. Let it's, me just turn the light. Sorry about that, brother. No problem. I didn't pay the bill. I didn't pay the bill. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. yeah sorry about Dude, that. That's insane, Lorenzo. Do you yeah. do you have um, one of the most popular questions I ask is uh, sure. advice for the youngins, the the men and women right. getting into law enforcement in, in today's day and age? Would you have any sage advice for them? You know what? If I had to do it all over again, I would definitely, I would have definitely gone to the military first. And for many reasons, it's the plan, it's the training that you get there that I think I think would make a better law enforcement officer. Um, discipline, the discipline, but also the veterans' preference that you get if you want to get on the job. You know, yeah. I think I think that's important. That'll help them you know, to get on. Um, the you know th- times have changed. I mean, the only advice I could give them is to never. To always look out for each other, you know, and, and, and to, you know, to, to, to be good people, you know, do the right thing, you know, do the right thing, uh, you know, protect your team, you know, like if they're your family, because they really are your family. Yeah. And, and you know, and the other advice I give a lot of cops that, want, that are starting out is become firemen. <laughs> That's what my dad said. Because everybody loves a fireman. <laughs> he goes, uh, yeah. my dad was a cop for 32 <laughs> years and he That's goes, something, yeah. he goes, don't be an idiot, be a firefighter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I never wanted to be a firefighter, but I, I see the job they have. You know, they have it. They have it. I mean, when there's a fire, so it's got to be the worst thing in the world. And I, I have the utmost respect for them. Of course. But um, they got it pretty good to us because we're not loved, you know? Yeah. I always say that when I go to a call, we go to all medicals that yeah. we can because right. um, there's not a lot of assets on the road. And I always right. tell the people, don't worry, the good guys are right behind me. Right, right. <laughs> the people you want to <laughs> see are coming. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, man. Lorenzo. But- Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. No, brother, it was an honor to talk to you, and, a, and really my pleasure, man. You know, it, it, you, you like I said, it's a great show. I like the fact that you're putting our message out there, our stories out there, and uh, you know, I'm always around. I'm always around, brother. If you ever need anything, uh, please I, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you, sir. I feel like I feel like you could come back. I feel like there's a lot more stories. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime, it'd be my honor to come back. I can we can get into a little more of the of the undercover cases and so forth if you want to and if you're interested. Awesome, I don't man. want to bore your fans. So No, are you kidding me? This is great, man. It's unbelievable. I really appreciate it. I'm going to um, no, thank you. do the outro here and throw you in the green room. Can you hang up for a second? Absolutely. Great. Sure. The great Lorenzo Toledo, guys. Crazy, crazy stories, and he's got a lot more, so definitely got to have him back. Uh, thank you for listening, guys. Thank you for rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. Um, I really appreciate that. And once again, if you really love the show and you want to join the Patreon community, that would be fantastic. You can do that right in the uh, show note links. Um, That's all I got for you this week, guys. Till next time.